Psychiatry and Psychology. I'm here to get her input on the use of mind-enhancing drugs such as Adderall and Ritalin among college students. And so, so, as shown in many stories in CNN and CBS that uh, certain ADHD drugs such as Adderall and Ritalin is uh, very prevalent among healthy college students in America. Do you feel that these sorts of drugs um, pose a certain benefit? Do you feel that their um, efficacy would is sort of useful for a lot of students in America? So I think it's less of a, a question about my feelings and more of a question about science. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly evidence that uh, uh, stimulant drugs that are used for ADHD are typically uh, helpful, at least in some contexts, for cognitive performance of various kinds. So. In studies, for example, with um, with amphetamine, which is the active ingredient in Adderall, um, it's been shown that it's effective for um, enhancing things like working memory and other kind of uh, what we call executive function tasks or cognitive tasks. Um, we don't know whether it categorically helps people do their homework. We don't know if it categorically helps people perform better on exams. But we do know that it keeps people awake. And that, um, again, under laboratory conditions in certain studies, uh, people take, choose to take Adderall in the same way that they would choose to take uh, coffee, for example, to stay awake and study for longer. Mm -hmm. And so that also might tra translate into better grades. So we have, uh, scientifically, a lot of reason to think that it's, uh, in fact, can enhance the um, uh, performance of even healthy adults who don't suffer from ADHD, mm -hmm. though potentially for different reasons than it does for people who suffer from ADHD. People who are against the certain the healthy people, healthy college students uh, using these types of drugs is the fact that they are not prescribed to them. They present, they present certain risks such as uh, addiction and psychosis. Um, do, you, do you believe that um, these risks um, should prevent students from taking these drugs and perhaps maybe seeking more legal alternatives? That's a great question. So. First and foremost, I think that any illegal purchase of drugs has its own risk, right? And so in general, and certainly as a professor at a university, I can't be uh, telling people that it's a great idea to buy illegal drugs from anybody. Also, you don't know what's in it. You don't know what you're getting. There are some risks that are associated with, with just getting stuff that's unknown from people. Um, uh, there are also always the concern of in drug interaction when you don't know what it is that you're taking and you haven't consulted the doctor and you're taking a drug that's quite powerful, um, that could have a danger onto itself. Um, then above and beyond that, yes, there's absolutely um, what we call abuse potential, or the potential to become addicted to any of these drugs. Um, a, lot of it, a lot of it has to do with um, who people are, both genetically in terms of their environment and historically. Some people have a greater chance than others, but in general, um, the risk for developing a substance use disorder or an addiction of some sort with amphetamine is not low. Um, so of, of the people who use amphetamines, uh, I think the recent statistic I've seen is about 12% to actually develop a problem. Um, uh, so some kind of, uh, kind of irregular use that we sometimes call addiction or a substance use disorder. Um, that's certainly something that needs to be accounted for. The risk is actually a little bit lower for people who take it uh, what we call via the oral route or take it um, uh, by taking a pill as opposed to snorting it or smoking it. So amphetamine is, is really only um, one methyl group away from, from methamphetamine, which we all know is crystal meth or meth, which uh, is a highly problematic um, or considered to be a highly problematic drug that a lot of people uh, um, uh, have argued very, very strongly should, um, you know, there's uh, the, meth, the Montana meth project and other kinds of uh, anti-meth movements, and there's the, the slogan, meth not even once. And, and amphetamine, which is the active ingredient in Adderall, is actually very close to it chemically. It has the same effect in the brain, it's just a little bit less potent. And, um, and so, uh, of course, there are risks associated with it. Um, whether it should prevent people from using it really, uh, uh, I think, is a matter of opinion. Uh, I certainly think that uh, in a world where people who are healthy could get this drug, uh, 
using either a prescription or some other kind of formal form, um, that kind of drug use can be very, very helpful and practical. Uh, it's the, the context under which someone chooses to take a drug is very important. And so if you get it from someone illegally and then maybe choose to snort it and do it irresponsibly and over time, you, you might develop tolerance, you might develop um, uh, withdrawal symptoms when you stop using it, you might develop other forms that are indicative of problem drug use. So I understand that stimulants like Adderall and Ritalin increase dopamine levels in um, synapses. Could you maybe elaborate on that and how that is similar to crystal meth? Sure, dopamine? sure. So Ritalin is actually very, very similar to cocaine and how it works. So it's true that both drugs increase uh, dopamine uh, in the uh, synapse in general in the brain. The way that Ritalin does it is by binding to what we call reuptake pumps. And so on every cell, on every neuron in the brain, um, uh, every neuron in the brain releases neurotransmitters of various sorts. Uh, some, some cells, the cells that release dopamine, will have often on their um, uh, synapse or on the kind of lining of the synapse, the membrane of the synapse, they'll have these little transporters. And what these transporters do is they actually um, suck the dopamine back into the cell. So dopamine gets released from the cell, it flies around in the synapse, some of it binds to the receptors on the next cell, which is how cells communicate, but some of it gets sucked back into the presynaptic cell and then it gets packaged back into these like little bubbles, which is um, how, how it will eventually get re-released out into the uh, synaptic cleft or the space between the two neurons. What uh, Ritalin does, methylphenidate, very similarly to cocaine, is it actually blocks that reuptake pump and it stops dopamine from being sucked back into the cell. And what that means is that there's just more dopamine flying around in the synapse, and therefore more dopamine available to be connecting to the next cell or be absorbed by the uh, receptors on the next cell, more likely to actually continue the dopaminergic action. What methamphetamine does, um, uh, similar, what amphetamine, which is the active ingredient Adderall does, very similarly to methamphetamine, they actually have the exact same mechanism of action. Um, is it actually, uh, well, it's thought to both do that, but also, um, it actually causes postsynaptic release of dopamine. So it actually makes the dopamine that's in the synapse release more into the presynaptic cleft. So it really raises dopamine levels above and beyond what they would normally be. Uh, and it's stronger in that sense than Ritalin is. Um, and uh, you also specifically asked me to talk about amphetamine and methamphetamine. They work in exactly the same way. So the active ingredient in crystal meth and the active ingredient in Adderall actually does the same thing. Methamphetamine is typically taken by different routes of administration. So crystal meth, when it's made by um, you know, illegal sources in a meth lab, uh, it's typically made into this crystal form, and then it's either uh, cut really finely and snorted, or it's smoked um, in a particular methamphetamine pipe, um, or some people also uh, inject it. So they, they melt it and then inject it. Uh, in all of these routes of administration, are much faster than taking it uh, through the stomach, taking it orally would be. Um, and so the, the, the rate at which this dopamine, dopaminergic change in the brain happens is much faster, which makes the effect feel much stronger. Um, and, and also more of it gets absorbed. So via the oral route, when you uh, swallow a pill, part of it gets you know decomposed in your stomach, uh, depending on what pill it is, like stomach acids might eat it, and then it takes a long time for it to sort of go through the intestines, absorb through the lining of either the stomach or the intestine, and only then is it carried in the blood to the brain, passes a blood-brain barrier. So there's a lot more, many more steps when you take something there with the oral route. And so you end up absorbing much less of the drug, and often you absorb it uh, much more slowly and over time, and so the effect is sort of lower, um, lower in intensity and maybe uh, over a longer period of time. In the Nature article towards responsible use of cognitive enhancing drugs by healthy by the healthy, um, the the authors had argued that certain mind enhancing drugs should be put in the same realm as eating, exercise, and uh, sleep, due to the yeah. fact that all all four all four things increased um, increase the mind's function. Right, I think that another, I, first of all, I thought that was a very compelling argument, actually, and one that I've often entertained myself. And I also think about it as very closely related to coffee, right? And, and even more than that, to nicotine. So nicotine, for example, is known, nicotine even administered via a nicotine patch, uh, is known to enhance certain cognitive function, both in people who are, who are smokers and people who are non-smokers. So um, uh, nicotine that's administered to people right before uh, a cognitive task where, let's say, they have to respond very quickly to a series of numbers, um, 
it makes them perform better. And uh, that makes nicotine a performance enhancing drug as well. Uh, certainly people who are cigarette smokers, when they're uh, not smoking, when they're in withdrawal, they start performing worse and worse and worse on cognitive tests. And if you give them nicotine or if you let them smoke a cigarette or if you give them a patch, they'll start performing better. So for them, nicotine is certainly a, a performance enhancing drug. Same with coffee. So people who use caffeine, uh, and caffeine in general, so tea, anything that has caffeine, Red Bull, um, people who are regular coffee drinkers, when they don't drink coffee, they start, uh, their performance becomes worse and worse, and then coffee becomes also a performance enhancing drug for them. And we all uh, ingest things like food, like sugar, to alter our um, uh, current state, right? So I know that right before we started this, I gave you some M&Ms, right? And I ate an M&M. We're both feeling a little bit sugar high right now. Um, I certainly know people who, uh, when I was in college, studied all night and would always study with like a bag of M&Ms next to them and a cup of coffee. Um, it actually really does beg the question, how is having a bag of M&Ms and a cup of coffee different from taking Adderall, assuming that you could get all three of them through kind of official channels and that they're all um, you know, Adderall is manufactured by drug manufacturers, we know what's in it. Um, I think it's a really good question, why not? As long as uh, we understand that there's an abuse potential with these kinds of drugs that might be somewhat higher than the abuse potential with chocolate. Although, now one of the things that are um, happening, even here at Yale Med School, is people are re starting to research um, certain eating disorders, like binge eating disorder and obesity in general, as really related to substance use. Kelly Brownell in the, in the psychology department has made good arguments to argue that um, uh, eating can be in some ways like an addiction for people, right? And so if sugar is an addiction for some people and yet we make sugar freely available, um, if uh, someone could monitor your particular intake of, uh, of amphetamine administered through an Adderall pill so that you can enhance your performance, I can certainly see a world in which that would be legitimate. And I think that um, one of the rate limiting steps is more the society's, uh, more society's attitudes than the actual um, problem with the drug itself. Not to say that I think everybody should start using Adderall tomorrow, but I think that under certain circumstances it can certainly be controlled. And just as an example for that, it's, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure the degree to which there's official verification for this in the American army. But um, in most armed forces of many countries, pilots, for example, routinely take uh, either amphetamine or methamphetamine pills with them on planes um, for long flights. I certainly know um, several pilots who uh, engage in this practice. So uh, even, even, the, um, even the government of this country is uh, approving the use of such drugs in cert under certain circumstances. So it can't be all bad. And certainly any drug that's um, even, so, so also, it's, it's like it, so amphetamine is considered a Schedule II drug, which means that it's, uh, it has a, an abuse potential, but it also has medical uses. And so um, certainly if you consider that um, Adderall is sometimes prescribed to kids as young as four and five, um, you have to understand that the, uh, there are mitigating circumstances for its use. So it's not all that, it's not evil, there are just some risks that are associated with it. In the same way that there's risks in driving a car, and yet we all drive cars. Believe that um, further studies, maybe studies solely on healthy people, um, for enhancing their cognitive abilities, would be a worthy endeavor for a lot of researchers. I don't know about a lot of researchers, but I think certainly for some researchers it would be a good endeavor, and for the scientific community at large. I mean, I'm a scientist, and I think a lot of what I do is driven by curiosity, and I'm certainly curious. Um, you know, if we take people who are healthy adults, and over the course of a year. Uh, randomize them into two groups. One group, every time they have an exam, will be allowed to take a sugar pill, and the other group will be allowed to take Adderall. And really try to see, um, randomly controlled, of course, taking the same classes perhaps, um, are people really doing better over time? Um, whether, but what, what is the chance of abuse when people begin this kind of sporadic, uh, um, uh, academically motivated, uh, use of this drug because I think a lot of you know the articles that you mentioned um, what they talk about is kind of um, under the radar use of some students in some schools where they get it from their friends who maybe do have prescriptions we have very very little data on how often these people use do they use it like once or twice during finals week do they are there people who kind of manage to get a full bottle and take a pill a day over the course of you know an entire semester 
um, what happens to their sleep pattern? Like one thing that I'd be concerned about since a lot of people take it, for example, during all-nighters, what happens to sleep? Do they not sleep? Do they make up that sleep? Sleep deprivation is really, really bad for a variety of things. So there's research that links sleep deprivation to um, being sick more and having overall um, poor health in the long run, being more susceptible to uh, various kinds of ailments over time, and certainly to higher stress and uh, poor physical health. If people take a lot of Adderall and don't sleep, uh, you can imagine there are interactive effects between these different kinds of components. So I think that's uh, because people do it, it's a very, very worthy target of study so that we understand under the circumstances when, you, when they use it, how harmful can it actually be. Of the people who begin using it uh, under these circumstances, what is the abuse potential? Like, What are the actual statistics on whether, you know, out of 100 kids who start using Adderall in this particular way, how many of them go on to begin abusing Adderall, taking it maybe in other routes of administration, um, starting to show craving and tolerance and withdrawal and those other kinds of, so, so in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, that's the book that we use to diagnose people. And um, there's now, I think, 11 different criteria. And starting, if you can endorse three of them, you are now considered to have a form of substance use disorder. And, and this is for the maybe DSM-5. So in DSM-4, there's uh, abuse and dependence, and they're slightly different. Um, and uh, the question is, how fast will people start endorsing these kinds of characteristics, like having craving, having repeated, making repeated attempts to quit but being unable to, suffering negative consequences to their lives from their Adderall use. Um, these are really all open questions that I know, for one, I would love to have the questions, the answers for. Um, I'm sure that even the, so I'm teaching a class, Drugs, Brain, and Behavior, and uh, I'm sure the students in my class would love to know the answer. And I'm sure that students like you would love to know the answer. Like, how dangerous is it really to start using these drugs? You know, is doing it once bad? Is doing it twice bad? Um, certainly some of the things that I can say is that if anybody uses this, these drugs regularly, they should expect that their brain will change. Some tolerance typically occurs with regular use of amphetamines. Um, some withdrawal symptoms might appear after regular use of amphetamine. The question is, what's considered regular? How regular is regular? How fast it happens? And people who are healthy adults using it recreationally, I don't think we have the data. Uh, I think that's it. Um, those are all the questions I have. Do you have any additional remarks you'd like to say? Um, yeah, I'd like to say on a safety note that any pill that you take without a doctor carries risks. You also don't know what your individual uh, dose should be. Some people are more and less sensitive to different doses of drugs. Um, and I feel like it's, it's kind of my academic responsibility to put that plug in there, that there, could, there are always risks with taking uh, medications that were not prescribed to you personally. Um, that being said, I think that the idea that we can take something that's going to make us perform better is something that's attractive to anybody. Um, and so uh, in a world where we can maybe put aside judgment about people wanting to perform better and actually use the tools of science to try to understand them better, we might all benefit in the end. <laughs>